The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. After hearing his doctrine, many of the followers of Jesus said, This is intolerable language. How could anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his followers were complaining about it and said, Does this upset you? What if you should see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh has nothing to offer. The words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the outset those who did not believe, and who it was would betray him. He went on, This is why I told you that no one could come to me unless the Father allows him. After this, many of his disciples left him and stopped going with him. Then Jesus said to the twelve, What about you? Do you want to go away too? Simon Peter answered, Lord, who shall we go to? You have the message of eternal life, and we believe. We know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. you and we thank you for your anointing now. May the fire of your word consume our sins and its brightness illumine our hearts. We praise you and we thank you. Amen. My dear friends, this weekend we have three readings which put together uh, for me are one of the most powerful combination of readings we can ever listen to or put together in the church regarding our salvation. I rejoiced so much when I saw these readings today, uh, for this weekend, sorry. I was a little bit saddened by the fact that our masses don't allow us to preach at length (laughs) on these readings. Because in truth and in fact, if we were to properly and genuinely and sincerely plunge the depths of the meaning of these readings combined today. Well, we can stay a number of days here with it, but if not, at least a few hours. However, that is not the case. So we will subject ourselves as best as we could uh, to trying to draw from these readings as much as we could in the time we have. Um, There are a number of approaches we can take as well, I've chosen the one I've chosen today. Um, And I begin with the opening prayer. Because this speaks, the readings this weekend speak directly to our salvation and our relationship with God. Um, And the the opening prayer locates uh, our understanding or our approach to these readings very well when it says... O God, who caused the minds of the faithful to unite in a single purpose, the God who causes the minds of all those who are faithful to him to unite in a single purpose, not everybody for themselves. Amen? Amen. 
following that? Good. Grant your people to love what you command. Grant your people to love what you command. And to desire what you promise. To love, Lord, what you command of us. And to desire what you promise us. That amid the uncertainties of the world, which we all know we live in, our hearts may be fixed on that place where true gladness is found, which of course is Christ. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. So I thought it's important for us to begin with just that. To locate ourselves and all those who are listening on the radio or seeing on television. All of us to begin to approach these readings today with that in mind. Lord, help me to love what you command of me. And to desire and hope for what you promise. Having said that, the other thing that I think is an important um, celebration of the, of the combination of these readings today is the responsorial psalm. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And I want to start with that little thing to lead into the gospel because the gospel is a response to Jesus saying, those who do not eat of my flesh and drink of my blood will not have eternal life. And the people are rejecting him for that. So I want to tell you very quickly about a, a memory I have of rejecting food. I remember as a child, I remember as a child, uh, my mother trying to, to get us to eat spinach. Now spinach is something you either love or you hate. You can't be in between. Or maybe you eat it as a duty for health. But for me, it was the most despicable thing I could possibly taste. For me. I'm not saying it is. For me. So I proceeded a couple of times to throw up the spinach at the, at the dining table to get the point across to my parents, I am not eating this. Well, I won that battle, mind you, and I was not made to eat spinach again. Many years later, as a grown man, however, I was eating in a French restaurant in, in uh, what do you call it, in uh, Maryland, and having had the first course of salad, which I thought rather delicious, I was told it was spinach leaves. <laughs> And I thought, okay. And then somewhere before that, but that was the crowning sense of it for me, uh, before that, someone told me about the amount of spinach in Sahina, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought to myself, okay. So this spinach that I rebelled against in my youth, I desired and enjoyed thoroughly in my less youthful years. <laughs> Taste and see that the Lord is good. The difference between the two times was a preparedness or willingness to, uh, um, to as it were, plunge the mystery or the depths of what was possible if you had spinach made well. <laughs> and Jesus is essentially saying, I am good for you. Consume me, eat of me and drink of me, for I am good for you. So, in that metaphor, if you will, or analogy of the spinach, I move on to the gospel this morning. And in that gospel, as I said a moment ago, Jesus is confronting those who would not accept that he was good food for their souls and, this is a key thing, and for their bodies. After hearing his, his doctrine, many of the followers said, this is intolerable language. How could anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his followers were complaining about it and said, does this upset you? And then he goes on to say, after another line he says, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh has nothing to offer. The words I have spoken to you are spirit. And they are life. A very important phrase. Well, it's more than a phrase. Very important um, stanza. It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh has nothing to offer. The words I have spoken to you are spirit. And they are life. In other words, the flesh has nothing to offer you. Except it is 
united with, informed by, and through grace, infused with the spiritual life. Amen? Amen. The flesh has nothing to offer by itself. But with grace and in the spirit, it becomes something glorious, life-giving, just like the body and blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. A very important to understand the connection there. But there are some of you who do not believe. That is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father allows him. And then he turns to his beloved disciples, his 12 apostles, and says, What about you? Do you want to go away too? Simon Peter answered, Lord, who shall we go to? You have the message of eternal life. And we believe. We know that you are the Holy One of God. So, what Peter is saying to Jesus is this. Lord, we are not theologically inclined. We are not filled with the wisdom of God about the deep theological meanings of what it is you're telling us right now. We do not in the least bit of, we hardly understand how on earth you could ask us to eat your body and drink your blood, eat your flesh and drink your blood. But we do know this. We know that you have the message of eternal life and therefore we put our faith in you because we know that you're the Holy One of God. You with me, everybody? So Peter and his apostles are moving beyond what the flesh can see and understand. They are moving beyond what they can conceive and, and, and appreciate in what Jesus is teaching them. They don't know what Jesus means fully by eating his body and drinking his blood or in what form that will take. They don't know. But they do know by faith who Jesus is. And so they are saying, Lord, we don't know what you mean, but we know you are the Holy One of God. Therefore, we stay. We have faith and we stay. We stay so that we can participate in your body and blood, whatever that might mean for us. So immediately, what Peter brings and the apostles bring to bear on their human understanding and their flesh is their life of faith. In other words, their spiritual life. We don't understand in our humanity, but we know who you are in our spirituality. And we will allow our spirit to dictate to our humanity and our flesh what is true and what is not true. Amen? Amen. Not the other way around. So, at this point, then, they become, they become more open to the reality of the Eucharist. And the food that Christ is, and what his, the grace of salvation would mean, not only for them, but for the whole world. For the Eucharist then becomes a meal in which they will, the whole church finds resonance in the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. This Eucharist, as it were, is the fruit of the cross, which in which everyone who calls themselves Catholic by virtue of their baptism will participate in the life of God. Amen? Amen. Now, what is the Eucharist referred to in the, by the fathers of the church? It's referred to as a heavenly banquet, a meal. What is baptism referred to by the uh, fathers of the church and in church teaching? It's referred to as a nuptial bath. You with me, everybody? Yeah. You haven't gone to sleep yet? No? Okay. Nuptial bath. Nuptial bath. Meaning, it's a preparation for marriage with God. For union with God. For communion with God. Amen? Yeah. Nuptial bath. And by virtue of that, it links, therefore, the whole of our Catholic faith and understanding to the marriage feast of the Lamb and to life with God understood in terms of marriage. So that's why Jesus is, well, they don't understand this at this point, but that is why Jesus is saying, what I am going to 
demand of you or command of you is going to be hard for you to accept if you think like the Gentiles. How do I know this? Well, because in the second reading today from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, St. Paul precedes this reading, which upsets a lot of people, thank God, um, uh, precedes this reading in Ephesians with some very important, again, doctrinal and theological underpinnings to prepare us to receive what is in Ephesians 5, verses 21 to 32 which we can't go into this morning, so I tell you I need a few hours, right? We can't go into that this morning. But St. Paul recognizes how important the relationship is between marriage, uh, between a man and a woman, and the relationship between Christ and his church, which, of course, begins in each of us in baptism. Amen? Yeah? Good. So, he prepares the minds of people by saying, you cannot think like the Gentiles. You have to think Sorry, put simply, you have to put on the mind of Christ. You have to see things through Jesus' relationship with his church. You have to see and understand that relationship as a marriage, a nuptial relationship. But let's put a pause on that for a moment. Because what Jesus is saying to the apostles and disciples is, what I'm going to ask of you is going to demand of you a level of faith that you may want or not be prepared to accept in your life. So make your choices. Make your choice. You either believe me and believe in me or you don't. You cannot share my voice with the other voices of the world because I alone am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? Yeah. Okay. So that is reflected in the first reading from Joshua. Joshua again uh, gathers the people of Israel and says to them, Listen, you've got to make a choice. Who are you going to worship as God? Who is going to be your God? Which Lord will you serve? And we have to answer the same question in today's world. Which Lord do we worship and which Lord will we serve? Is it one created by us called humanism? Is it one created by us called self-gratification? Is it one created by us like those of the Amorites or the ancestors beyond the river? Which God do you want to worship? And he, uh, Joshua says to the people, As for me and my family, my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a, a declaration that we ourselves have to determine today in our lives. Otherwise, there's no point in going any further. We too will serve the Lord, for he is our God. That is what the people respond. And that's exactly what's happening in the gospel here. Jesus is asking the apostles, well, so who are you going to listen to? And Peter answers, Lord, who shall we go to? You are the one that has the message of eternal life. And we put our faith in you. Now, having said all of that, you boy, we run out of time. We run out of time already, but we'll continue. <laughs> having said all of that, we look now... At the second reading, which is a crowning reading, interestingly enough, I think, in this combination of readings. And it's a reading in which St. Paul calls the church to a deeper understanding of their salvific history and their salvation in the light of their human bodies. And, specifically, marriage, the sacrament of marriage. Give way to one another in obedience to Christ. So he starts with the most important element of this relationship which is give way to one another in obedience to Christ. So central to the relationship between spouses, which St. Paul tells us at the end, I am saying it applies to Christ and the church. This mystery of communion and union and the, 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 the man and the woman becoming one flesh in the sacrament of marriage, this mystery has many implications, and it does. But I am saying it applies to Christ and the church, which, of course, is the ultimate of those impl implications. That the marriage of Christ and his church, sorry, the relation between Christ and his church is a marriage. And the, the marriage between a man and a woman reflects that relationship, whole and entire, in a, in a mysterious way, but in a real way, through grace. Okay, so he's saying that. But he says for us to accept that, 
We must give way to one another, I'm talking about husband and wife, in obedience to Christ. The key thing of, about this then is subjection to the will of God. Putting your faith in God first and giving way to one another as an aspect of self-donation and giving oneself to each other in obedience to Christ. You with me everybody? Now only when you understand what that means will you understand the next few sentences, which is what causes a lot of people to rebel. Wives should regard their husbands as they regard the Lord. Since as Christ is head of the church and saves the whole body, so is a husband the head of his wife. And as the church submits to Christ, so should wives to their husbands in everything. And why is all the men in the congregation here and outside there maybe smiling, grinning from ear to ear and can't wait to tell the women in their lives how important it is to bow down before them and so on. If that's what they are thinking, then they completely misunderstand their relationship between God and them and their spousal relationship. Because the moment dominance of any kind comes into the relationship, you're removing yourself from love and from giving way to one another in Christ. Amen? Amen. So the moment any kind of dominance infiltrates that relationship on the part of anybody, then immediately you're compromising the mystery. You with me, everybody? Yeah. So don't think that. Husbands should love their wives just as Christ loved the church and sacrificed himself for her to make her holy. So right away again, uh, St. Paul is alluding to the relationship between Christ and his church. Understanding the importance of this relationship as sacrament, as a revealing the love of God in the Blessed Trinity, which men and women are called to, as it will, enter into and participate in, in their lives as husband and wife. Amen? And by extension, as church. It's a very important teaching. Because you see, when you understand that teaching, and I can't, again, I have to stop here and, and go to the end very quickly, so I, we can't plunge the rest of it. But at the end of it, uh, for this reason, St. Paul says, a man must leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one body. This mystery has many implications, but I am saying it applies to Christ and the church. And, and I will end then with this instruction. That is why it, the church is very clear and uh, very uh, specific in its, its proclamation that you cannot have same-sex marriage. Very clear. Because the, the instructions of scripture are very clear. It is God created them male and female. In his image and likeness, he created them. When male and female come together, and that's plunging the part of plunging the mystery of what's being said here. When male and female come together in harmony and in the particular relationship of spousal uh, and nuptial unity, when they do that, it is only then that they reflect the fullness of the life of God in the Trinity. And there's no other combination that can accomplish that for both uh, uh, anthropological reasons and theological reasons, not to mention biological reasons. <laughs> All right? And no amount of beating our head against the wall or trying to somehow or the other manipulate, and I use the word here very freely in my mind, manipulate Gentile thinking could we force that kind of thinking into the mind of Christ because it cannot meet the demands of that doctrine, of that particular understanding of what a marriage is as it reflects the relationship between Christ and the church. Now, it's unfortunate. Now, this is not in any way to condemn anybody's um, sexual orientation or any LGBT, EBC, ZZ, whatever communities, right? Whatever many letters we have. It's not about that. It has nothing to do with that. We are talking here about the sacrament of marriage, a specific thing. And no amount of 
manipulating and adding up and minusing or dividing and mathematics we could put together can change the particular uh, aspect of, of the church's life that has to do with uh, marriage between man and woman and its reflection of the sacramental life of the church. And one of the reasons the, the church says that or claims that or proclaims that or defends that is because it understands actually that the descent of the sacramental life of the church is precisely this relationship between Christ and the church, which St. Paul tells us reflects a nuptial mystery. You with me, everybody? Or the other way around. The nuptial mystery reflects the relationship between Christ and his church. So, my dear friends, be very free and bold and clear in your mind of what is true and what is not true. And, as I have said often and I always will say, the truth will set you free. No matter what sexual orientation you have, the truth will set you free. You cannot claim freedom or gain freedom in the context of falsehood and deception. You can only gain freedom when you speak the truth to yourself and to the others and to the world. So, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.